Hey everyone, it's Tom Kratz. I want to talk to you about M2. What M2 is, is the broad money supply here in Canada. Let, let me make my face smaller here so you can see this chart. M2 is what is discussed by economists and economic analysts as the money supply circulating in our economy. And if you look up the definition, it'll be like money in our checking accounts. Sometimes they refer to money market funds, but it basically it's the money circulating in our economy. And I'm going to skip through the charts here because I want to show you a couple things. In Canada, that has increased about 20% in the last year. And because the broad money supply, and this is really important when it's going to come to real estate prices in a second here, when the broad money supply increases, it's often done by things like we've done here in Canada with CERB and payroll subsidies and just basically new money that is being created out of thin air and stuffed into the economy by the government that is growing the broader money supply. And economists like to argue about this back and forth, but that's kind of a general idea of what's happening. When the government, with the help of the Bank of Canada, increases the money supply, M2 goes up, and we have more dollars circulating in the economy. And in Canada in the last year, it went up like crazy. It went up like 20%. That is a huge increase in the amount of dollars that are, are floating around in our economy. And if I skip around to the next slide here, yeah, I, I, I took a look at the G4 central banks. So if you look at um, outside of Canada, what is happening, if we look at the UK, the UK increased their M2 16%. And I'm going to get to why this is important in a second. And then we thought, okay, let's flip around. To, what about Japan? And Japan had quite a spike. Japan, you can see the pace of this chart. It, it was going at this speed. And then it kind of just spiked up. It went up at 17%. And then the Eurozone. The Eurozone kind of spiked up a, a real healthy 14% right there. And then there's the States. This is from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. This is a chart from uh, for their M2 money stock. And you can see it just shot up with all the stimulus that they just stuffed into the US economy over the last year. It went up 25%. So, you know, if there was $100 in the entire economy two years ago, in the past year, there's now 125 Okay, so that's what's happening. There's just more money circulating around in the economy. And if we look at this next chart, um, we thought, okay, what, what, what happens if we go outside the G4 and outside of Canada? Well, look at India. India shot up 20% with their M2. And then we thought, okay, well, what about other countries? And we looked at Brazil. We're like, whoa, wait a second. This is starting to look like it's a global thing. Brazil went up 30%. Then we looked up at Mexico. We're like, wow, look at Mexico's M2 money supply. Me Mexico went up 14%. And then we looked at Thailand, 13%. Look at that spike right there in the last year. And then we thought, okay, well, what about Russia? Now, Russia's pace didn't look like it increased that much, but it did increase a little bit here. And that went up 20%. Their M2 went up 20% in the last year. And then China, China's data looks so perfect here on this rise. I'm not sure how clean this data is that we're, we're getting from China's reporting, but it still did go up 12 and percent. And that's when Nick and I had a bit of a moment and we were like, holy smokes, we have been looking at the U S and we have been looking at Canada when it comes to the economy and how much the U S influences Canada, how much the U S will dictate interest rates here in Canada and why interest rates are so important to the real estate market locally here in Canada and in the GTA and the uh, golden horseshoe. But this M2 thing, this increase in money supply is totally global. And we had never looked at it like that. There is this mass devaluation at play. Sorry, I'm using this presentation and it wasn't set up exactly for what I'm doing here. So some of the words are getting cut off, but I just have a few more slides I wanna show you. I think it was Michael Saylor of MicroStrategy. He made a lot of uh, headlines over the last year, I guess, because he now owns, I think it's like 111 thousand Bitcoin or something like that. But anyway, on a, a few different podcasts, he had a really interesting answer as to why he was putting some money into what he considered harder assets. And he thought there was this hurdle rate of capital, meaning that capital or money is devaluing at about, and I think the rate he was using it was about 15%, which I thought was really interesting. 15% so that you had to make more than 15% with your savings, your investments, you had to grow your income more than 15% to achieve this hurdle rate or get ahead of the devaluation that's going on in the currency. And I know I have an example I want to show, you know, how that's applying to us right here in the GTA, but I love that kind of term hurdle rate and I find myself using it uh, all the time now. So in Canada, we might be leading, uh, leading the way with this M2 growth. And you could be listening to this and you could be saying, well, who cares? You know, why does this even matter? I have other problems in my life to deal with and we all do. And that's totally fair. 
But what really caught Nick and I's attention is when this went global, we thought there was a primary shift, a structural shift in the monetary policy globally, and it's affecting us right here. So if we look at these GTA prices, can I make my face even smaller here? If we look at these GTA prices, look at this. Here's over the last year, this is March. If you go to, if you just Google up and you want this data yourself, because I think the URL I have is in the bottom here is tiny. If you just go to Toronto Real Estate Board, Google up Toronto Real Estate Board stats, you will get links to the latest stats, which is at this point, um, probably last month, so it's April, and then you can hit on the history and you'll get all the stats. So if I look at March, was when I, uh, is, and, and the reason I looked at March is because that's when a lot of the M2 growth started happening here in Canada, when COVID you know, shut down the economy and the government started acting and, and buying different Canadian bonds in the US, they were doing the same thing. So I wanted to look at March of last year to March of this year. And you can see that property prices here in the Toronto area, this is on the Toronto Real Estate Board, you know, have all gone up. Here's the years, the dollar amounts here. You can see percentages here. Um, different categories have gone up. Condos kind of suffered a, a little bit. And that was kind of to be expected as people ran out of Toronto there for a bit. I, I think that that wave we've seen in the last few months coming back. But so prices have gone up. But we thought this is fascinating. If you look at the average price, and I know as, as a sophisticated real estate investor, you cannot do much with averages. But I want to use the average here to illustrate an important point. And in the average price went up 21.6% across the entire Toronto real estate board year over year, 21%. Now I have to ask you something. If Canada's M2 went up 20%, so the amount of dollars that got stuffed into the economy went up 20%. Let me flip back here. And real estate went up 21.6%. That seems sneakily too sneakily can't believe I used that word, uh, sneakily, that, uh, that seems a little bit too coincidental for our liking. And so if our currency was devalued by 20% and real estate went up by 20%, and again, I'm using averages here, you know, I'm kind of rounding here a little bit to illustrate a point. I understand that single family homes in some areas like Oakville went up much more than 20%. Condos in Toronto did not go up 20%. I'm trying to illustrate a point on why everyone in Canada should pay attention to M2. So if currency was devalued by 20% and real estate went up by 20%, prices relative to the, current, to the currency in the system stayed flat. Prices relative to the currency stayed flat. If we adjust the real estate prices by the amount of Canadian currency that was printed, then prices, prices actually stayed flat. In real terms, prices haven't moved in the past year. It's been the devaluation of the dollars in all of our pockets by 20% that have moved prices. When you divide real estate by the amount of currency in the system, prices haven't gone up. They've stayed completely flat. And another way to illustrate that, I wanted to build this slide for you, but it was getting too complicated with this video recording. So I just put it here like this to make this last point. The central banks are changing the denominator in the economy, but they're not really telling anybody. So for example, if real estate was 5% of the economy, so if you look at this five here, if it was 5% in the whole economy, which is, you know, M2 is all the dollars in the whole economy. So if the whole economy and the amount of dollars in the whole economy was 100 and real estate was 5% of the whole economy, which by the way, it's actually not, it's actually more than, than that. But I'm just trying to illustrate a point here. Um, if real estate was 5% of the whole economy and if prices doubled, so if prices doubled and you're like, wow, real estate prices doubled. So in a year, if prices went from five to 10 and they doubled, you would think prices went up. However, if the amount of dollars or M2 also doubled in the economy and they went from 100 to 200, prices could have doubled, but real estate would still be 5% of the economy. In real terms, they really haven't moved anywhere. And that's the thing that no one catches because everyone, all of us, and I, you know, I'm guilty of this too. We all look at just the prices like, wow, prices went from five to 10, they went up. But if you measure them against all the dollars in the system, did they really go up? They're still real estate still in this 10 over 200 example, real estates are still just five, real estate is still just 5% of the economy, just as it was before prices doubled. So it's this devaluation of the currency that really gets tricky. 
And this is what we get asked a lot. Well, this can't continue. There's just no way. How are people going to qualify? You know, this just can't work forever. And we will talk about that in future Rockstar Minutes that we do. Um, but the big point here is there is this hurdle rate. We believe your savings, your investments, your income, everything has to go up by 15 to 20% just to keep pace with the gross, the, the growth, sorry, the gross growth, the growth of M2. You have to increase all of your savings, your investments, your income by 15 to 20%. Otherwise, the devaluation is going to make you fall behind. And one other way to look at this is when we look at this chart. This is Stats Canada data of income, income growth at the bottom line across Canada from like 1969. And then if you look at house price growth, this is house price growth on the Toronto Real Estate Board. So I know I'm taking Canadian income here and, and uh, comparing it to Toronto real estate prices. But again, I'm just trying to illustrate this point. And you can see that a lot of the devaluation of currency really benefits asset owners. Like, look at this. This was 2017 when prices came down a little bit. And now we've updated it. Take a look at now. This is over the past year. Look at it now. That, that was 2017. Look at this growth now. So a lot of people are using income growth. To be fair, that's what we're all trained to do and taught to do. But you're, we're using income growth to keep up with things like assets, to keep up with house prices. And everybody gets mad at house prices, saying, what, you know, house prices, can, how, how are they going to continue? This isn't really right. Real estate prices can't keep going up like this. And it's true. But the problem isn't real estate prices in and of themselves. It's government policies that stuff so much money just bluntly into the economy instead of strategically that it's not really prices going up. It's the devaluation of the dollars in our pockets that is devaluing income. It's devaluing your savings. And if, and if you don't keep up at like 15 to 20% growth now, you are not crossing that hurdle rate of devaluation and you are falling behind. It's why the rich re get richer. The asset owners get richer. It's not right. We don't agree with it. We just want to understand it, this so we can try to front run it with everyone we work with and for ourselves and our families. So that's it. Hopefully you find that useful. Until next time, your life your terms.